Hi guys, I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture. And my name's Kobe Dick, Mr. Dick if you're nasty. Anyway, coming up today, we're going to talk about Chris Jericho, who claims that he will never return to WWE again. We're also going to talk about a major change to tonight's WWE Raw lineup. And on top of that, we've got some rather spicy comments from AJ Styles talking about who ruined TNA for him. Who could that be? Be. Anyway, also coming up, the real reason Gallows and Anderson signed with Impact Wrestling. NWA World Champion Nick Aldis shoots on WWE's Bruce Pritchard, and a former WWE champion returned over the weekend. Oh, and happy birthday, Triple H. This is the news. Yeah, have a good one, Paul. Um, first story, let's kick things off talking about Chris Jericho. He was on his YouTube channel this weekend getting up to all kinds of hijinks and one of the matters he spoke on was a potential return to WWE. Speaking on going back to it, he simply said, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, adding that he like really just really enjoys being in AEW. So I've got a quote from him here. Uh, I loved my time in WWE. I love Vince McMahon. I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun. But listen, you can't stay in the same place forever. You become stagnant if you do that, and I think you need to push yourself to do something new. The fact that AEW was live without a net uh, when I first showed up, and all of us have done such a great job of promoting this brand and company. So, Jericho hasn't wrestled for WWE. I think his last match would have been the greatest Royal Rumble in 2018. Uh, he's obviously a very important part of AEW. He's the first world champion. He remains a centerpiece now. Even when he's not, you know, fighting for the belt, he's headlining shows with Orange Cassidy. He is crowning himself the demo god, much to the chagrin of people who care way too much about things like that. Um, so it's basically just, you know, the 49-year-old saying, no, I'm, I'm never going back there no matter what. Now, the, you know, the, the only real scenario I can imagine Jericho ever really going back in there is one, if he falls out with Tony Khan and all the AEW guys, or two, if AEW goes out of business. Now... You know, uh, you don't want to sit here and forecast and speculate on things like that, but I don't think either of those look particularly likely at the moment. And uh, he's already shown in the commentary booth in AEW that when he does have to retire from wrestling, then he's great at that, and he can just do that as a career instead. So I think they'd love to have him around in that department as well. So, yeah, fair play, Chris Jericho. You're doing your thing. It's a work. He's coming back at the Royal Rumble. <laughs> Moving on. No, of course. Um, I'm not really surprised at hearing this. Like you say, he's having a whale of a time in AEW. Uh, he's got his fingers in a lot of pies there. Um, and yeah, in terms of like being allowed to do creative stuff and obviously in the fact that he's trying to raise other guys up and, and, and put them over him. I think he's doing a stellar job. Um, he is uh, not only... I don't see a reason why he would want to leave AEW. I don't see any reason why AEW would want to let him go. Like, you talk to casual wrestling fans, and one of the, the reasons why they get their head turned towards AEW, eventually, uh, is the likes of Jim Ross and Chris Jericho. They go, oh, I remember Jim Ross from the Attitude Era. Oh, what about the Attitude Era? Chris Jericho sort of ushers them in through the door, and then people go, oh, the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Orange Cassidy, uh, Darby Allen, Moxley. Like... He's the sort of conduit to try and get new fans into AEW. And yeah, I don't see that changing for a long, long time. Like you said, uh, even if, and we wouldn't wish this on anyone, something terrible would happen that prevented him from wrestling, um, he could step into the commentary booth full-time without an issue for me. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of options. He could do some coaching. He could do some managing. He uh, could do all kinds of things. Chris Jericho is just a guy who can adapt to any situation and a master of reinvention, a guy who keeps himself relevant no matter what the hell's going on. The only time Chris Jericho hasn't been like a credit to whatever company he's been in uh, that I can think of in recent years when he was doing that rooty, tooty, booty thing with the new... That wasn't good at all, but uh, it's a record of pretty much just consistent greatness otherwise. So fair didn't play. They, didn't they tease some sort of feud with The Shield as well at one point? Yeah. He just sort of joined them for a tag match, lost, and then pushed past them. Yeah. But he's always bloody working, isn't he? Isn't he? Yeah, so he's who a knows? Old rascal. He's a wee rascal, isn't he? Uh, anyway, let's talk a little bit about Impact Wrestling and Gallows and Anderson now. It's oh, just over a week now since they returned to Impact Wrestling and they've been talking on the Wrestle Talk in the D podcast about the reason they re signed with that promotion, uh, stating that the executive vice president, Scott Damore, was one of the main reasons that they were brought back into the fold. Um, they, of course, 
helped, uh, or he helped Luke Gallows get into New Japan after leaving TNA in 2013. Uh, and uh, Gallows called the Impact exec, quote, a good friend. Uh, Gallows called it a very nice offer that had an unlimited schedule. Um, the most important thing to Luke, though, was that, quote, Impact were fully on board with co-promoting our brand, Talking Shop, which has already been referenced several times on television. And in talking about Impact, he obviously has to talk about his time in WWE, uh, saying that there wasn't a lot of room for that type of promotion in WWE, but Impact are happy to do it. Uh, it seems like this has worked out best for everyone here, Andy. Seems like a really sweet deal they've got there. Um, the Talking Shop thing has been featured quite prominently in their appearances so far. Um, Impact will allow that flexibility. WWE are obviously a little bit more straight ahead when it comes to things like that, and it's like, no, if it's not ours, it's probably not going to get promoted. Um, it, I'm interested to know what he means by unlimited schedule. I take it he doesn't mean he's working 20 days a week. Yes. Um, I take it he just means like a greater flexibility and stuff there. Be interesting to see if there's a, a New Japan allowance on, on this contract. That was rumored before they signed the deal. Um, it's somewhere that I think both of them would really love to go back, but yeah, fair play to them, the Good Brothers. They, they seem like a couple of really likeable dudes. You wish only the best for people like that. I believe they make their in-ring debut on this week's show, and uh, you know, Impact's doing some good things. I read over the weekend that Impact's viewership for the post anniversary episode of their TV went up by something like 10 times. It was like a crazy increase. To be fair, before that, uh, and, and this isn't concrete numbers, this is based off my memory, and my memory is like Swiss cheese, uh, Swiss cheese. They went from something like 12,000 the previous week to 100 odd thousand the week after on the back of Slammiversary, which got all kind of buzz. So Empire's doing good things right now. Hope that little, uh, you know, the snowball momentum continues. Indeed, and like you say, I think this is working best for everyone. And especially with what's going on with Bullet Club in, in New Japan. It'd be fascinating if Gallows and Anderson can return there, even just sporadically. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, let's talk about tonight's WWE Raw lineup. So the whole point of this week's Raw was that we're going to have two big title matches, right? Two rematches from Extreme Rules, the horror show Extreme Rules, and it's going to pop a nice little number because we've got these two big matches we're giving away on TV. Well... One of them's not a title match anymore. Uh, this is noted by Dave Meltzer, I almost called him Dave Ziegler, in the uh, Wrestling Observer's Daily Update news report, showing that uh, WWE have quietly turned Dolph Ziggler versus Drew McIntyre into a non-title match, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense given the way that bout came together on last week's show, but it's what they've done. It's no longer a title match. Uh, Sasha versus Asuka very much is still a title match, so... That's interesting to note. It should be stated that Drew McIntyre is still set to make the stipulation. Mm. This is a reversal of Extreme Rules where Dolph Ziggler made the stipulation and like an idiot chose a stipulation that he could still lose in, um, stating that the title could change hands if uh, Drew was disqualified or kind out, but it was no DQ and no kind out for him. The weird situation, they've just kind of changed it over. Presumably they have something in mind. Um, you know, there, there, there's lots of talk of Randy Orton versus Drew for SummerSlam at the moment. Maybe this could set that up somehow. Maybe Randy will interfere, cost Drew the match, set that up. Who knows? We'll see what happens on Raw. Yeah, I've got to be honest. Gun to my head, if you'd have asked me over the weekend, is this a title match? I couldn't have told you because I couldn't remember whether or not they'd said, oh, and the WWE Championship will be on the line or whatever. Or if it was just Drew toying with Dolph Ziggler a little bit longer. You hope... And this is, this is a real stretch. You hope that WWE had a thought about it and said, yeah, as you mentioned there, Andy, Randy Orton's apparently already going to announce his uh, SummerSlam opponent on tonight's show. You hope that they've gone, right, well, the obvious way of doing that without having just come out and say Drew McIntyre is have him attack him and cost him this match. And then you would say, okay, well, if we're going to do that and that's going to lead to a DQ, let's not bait and switch our audience by suggesting the WWE Championship is going to be on the line when we know it's not really going to a proper finish. Yeah. I don't know whether that's or not that's the case, but I am really looking forward to Monday Night Raw tonight. Like you said, you've got um, the non-WWE Championship match. You've got Sasha versus Asuka, which was phenomenal right up until the finish at Extreme Rules. Um, you've got that triple threat with... What was it? The two fly crew, the Viking Raiders, and Andrade and Ankel Gaza uh, to see who faces the Street Profits at SummerSlam. And what I'm really looking forward to, Dominic's going to confront Seth Rollins tonight. And if you want to know our thoughts on all of this, make sure you subscribe to What Cult Dressing, wherever you get your podcasts from. Because myself, one of the Dadly Boys, is going to be looking ahead on the Raw preview later. But I can't wait. 
yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a good show. I'm actually writing the uh, review for the website tomorrow. Um, Scott Carlson's on holiday. Look out for that. Um, please, for the sake of my sanity, I hope it's a good show and I hope you're praying for it as well because if it's not, I'm going to have to bury the goddamn thing. And I don't like doing that uh, if it's earnestly crap. So be good, please. Please. I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> Uh, let's talk a little bit about Nick Aldis. I mentioned in the intro there. He has been shooting on Bruce Pritchard, uh, releasing a video on Twitter all about him. Although, we should say that isn't just out of, you know, completely out of the, the blue. Uh, this is a result of Bruce Pritchard on his Something to Wrestle podcast, uh, critiquing Aldis um, and NWA Power. He said that the Englishman doesn't have the, quote, it factor required to be a major wrestling star. To which Nick Aldis responded on Twitter. I'm just going to read the tweet directly. Hi, at Bruce Pritchard, your ignorant comments about me had, had me at an all-time low, kind of like your raw ratings. <laughs> However, there are a few Hall of Famers that seem to have a different opinion, some of which are even featured below. P.S. I'll be live on Busted Open Radio tomorrow a.m. And he produces, produces like a two-minute video, which is really good, actually. Go and watch it. At Real Nick Aldis on Twitter. Um, that is how you respond to your critics, Andy. Yeah, I mean... Uh... I don't know if this is really a good time for Bruce Pritchard to be talking about major stars when he's the creative lead on Raw and, and SmackDown and Raw is posting all-time record low ratings. It, you know, obviously there are more factors that come into that, but come on, don't throw stones when you live in a glass house, brother, brother. And, uh, you know, you've seen photos of Titan Towers. It is definitely made of glass. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can't really argue with Nick Aldis here. He, uh, he's absolutely right. The ratings suck. Uh, Nick Aldis is the centerpiece of the NWA. He's found a nice little groove there. He's a tremendous world champion type character. I think he's proven a lot of people wrong uh, since the emergence of power and even before that, the way he conducts himself, the way he carries himself. Um, Nick Aldis is also still only 33 years old, which is mental. I feel like he's been wrestling for yeah. ages. Uh, and he, the fact that he kind of presents himself as like an old timey wrestling champion factors into that as well. So it's hard to disagree with the man. Um, is Nick Aldis the kind of guy who's ever going to headline WrestleMania? Well, if you believe Nick Aldis, there's people in the company who don't want him to be hired by WWE, but I could absolutely see him being, like, you know, even more of a significant star than he is at the moment. Um, I like the guy a lot. I think he has a lot to offer. I think he has an interesting point of view, so that busted open radio interview should be a lot of fun. Yeah, exactly. I thought this was a great response, um, and I really enjoy Nick Aldis. And like you say, I remember him back in TNA with, like, the British Invasion or what have you, and... He was, I mean, he, I I would have guessed he's like 40 odd as a result of that. But yeah, still a lot of time left, hopefully, in the wrestling industry. Nick there proving, Andy, he really is all dis and more. Yep. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about AJ Styles. Um, he's been using his Twitch channel to be a right spicy bugger Ooh. recently, hasn't he? Um, just firing barbs at Paul Heyman last week saying he couldn't stand to look at him. Well, now AJ has spoken a little bit about his past in TNA and he's um, named the one person who ruined TNA or Impact Wrestling for him and it was Vince Dixie Carter. It was Dixie Carter. Um, he says that he 100% believes that Dixie ruined TNA. He says that there was a time when TNA was uh, really gaining ground. The problem was that Dixie wanted to be WWE light, and that's not what the people wanted. They wanted something else, and all she had to do was let us do what we do. It really was that simple. He goes on a little bit, um, stating that if Carter had just stepped away a little bit and let the writers do their job, Impact would be a lot bigger than it is today, and TNA might have survived uh, as what it was. And he alleges that her inability to recognize what was good for business hurt the company. He also speaks a little bit about Vince Russo, uh, saying that he <laughs> loves the guy personally, friend of the channel, Vince Russo, big fan of us. Uh, they butted several times, however, when it came to creative matters, but AJ believes that this was because Russo was getting instructions from Dixie. So, a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, Dixie Carter is one of the easiest people to point the finger at when it comes to TNA's demise and slip in popularity, and to be fair, she would have made most of the destructive decisions. So, you know, bringing in Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff, uh, going live on Monday nights, all of that stuff just really ran the promotion in the ground. Bringing Vince Russo back secretly against Spike TV's wishes, oh my just, God. it's a catalogue of really bad decisions, and Dixie Carter has to be held accountable for a degree of them. 
Yeah, sorry, just mentions of AJ Styles and Dixie Carter giving me flashbacks there to the Claire Lynch storyline. So I was just oh. going to gather my thoughts for a second there. Um, but yeah, I think AJ isn't the first and he won't be the last to point the finger at Dixie Carter for the demise of TNA. Uh, we've heard, heard Bruce Pritchard talk about it on his podcast. Uh, Jim Cornette, there are a series of excellent rants on YouTube where he, in the space of 60-odd minutes, just catalogues every terrible decision that was made and and how they just sort of burnt through uh, all the money in that promotion. Like you say, whatever decision had to be made, they picked the worst choice. And I'd include Vince Russo in all mm. of that as well. But uh, yeah, I think you can only blame Russo to a certain extent, and I'd blame him quite a lot personally. But anyway, uh, you can only blame for a certain extent because at the end of the day, you know, you can only blame the writers in WWE to a certain extent. It's all got to go through Vince McMahon and you sense something similar, uh, at least on the bigger decisions, let's say, all has to go through Dixie Carter. But let's talk about a returning former WWE champion at the weekend. Uh, this weekend's just gone Game Changer Wrestling homecoming event in Atlantic City, New Jersey. We saw the return of... The 25-year-old piece of gold. I want to be a cowboy, baby. God, it's good to say that again. Leo Rush returned to the wrestling ring. Uh, he attacked AEW's Joey Janela at the end of the first night, setting up a bat with him on Sunday. Uh, Rush surprised everyone with all of this. He had a match with him, which was dubbed a retirement match. Leo Rush lost and basically said, thanks, everyone. Bye. To which Joey <laughs> Janela said, no, I'm not letting you retire yet. And, uh, well, he responded, bye. So, who knows? I really hope this, is the last, this isn't the last, I should say, we'll see of Leo Rush in wrestling. He's so talented. Obviously, he's got other stuff going on, music career, etc. But I hope, outside of WWE, he can really rediscover what made him so good. Yeah, it's at the end of the day, it's the same thing with a lot of these things, isn't it? You just want the person to make the decision that makes them the happiest. Um, but at the same time, Leo Rush is so much fun. We love Leo Rush. We talk about him quite often. And he's. Uh, it would be a shame to see a guy that young step away from the, the nearest business when he still has so much to offer. He's just a great pro wrestler. I haven't seen the GCW show about yet, but I'm looking forward to checking it out tonight. Looks like a lot of fun. The screenshots of it just kind of like on like a boardwalk at the beach at the ocean it looks incredible and um by all accounts a very very good night a uh, couple of nights of shows there yeah man who knows if leo is actually retired or not i suspect we haven't seen the last of him but he's a pretty unpredictable guy who knows what he'll do next yes exactly whatever decision makes him happy he should stick with personally we'd all love him especially as, a, as he's a friend of the channel to see him back in a wrestling ring full time right let's move on to your twitter questions at what culture wwe of course you want to get in touch with us first question today comes from jason sawatka who says tonight randy orton is set to kick off raw uh, by announcing his next opponent besides the obvious answer of drew mcintyre who is someone else you guys would like to see the legend killer go up against rick flair obviously not that would be very very cruel um my default answer to this kind of every single time as well, established veteran, like 13 world championships or 12, whatever it is, uh, legend, future Hall of Famer, all these things. I like to see people like that put over younger, hungrier, new talent and just pick a pick a rising baby face on Raw, throw them against Randy Orton and Apollo Crews, that might be cool. Um, Alistair Black would be a cool one, but they kind of, you know, did a number of him on Raw, on, uh, on him on Raw last week, so maybe that's not a possibility, but... It's always someone from that young, upcoming group of hungry talent who could really benefit from the rub of working with someone like the Legend Killer. Yeah, if you're allowed to pick from, from other shows, I think after his brilliant showing on SmackDown, although he didn't win that Fatal 4-Way, I'd have to say Chad Gable, not short and plotty G. Um, Riddle, Riddle Orton would be fun, wouldn't it? Let's be honest. Uh, and then potentially, you know, as a first step up, if he does decide to move to the main roster, Adam Cole. Yeah. Just a thought, but yeah, I think I think like you say, Andy, pick any rising up and comer and have him beat Randy Orton. For God's sake, don't beat him with an RKO out of nowhere. You know, we saw what that did to the likes of Rusev and what have you. So yeah, uh, pick, pick, take your pick. I think there's many, many names that could really do with with facing someone like this. And hopefully, if he does lose to Drew McIntyre at SummerSlam, the, the shine off defeating a name like his won't be removed too much because I really think in the 
the gap between SummerSlam and, and WrestleMania that could really be used to put over some young talent, like you say, Andy. Uh, second question today comes from Mark Salod on Twitter, who says, Hey guys, what do you think about CM Punk coming in as Darby Allen's manager to go against Brian Cage and Taz? The promos alone would be amazing. That they would. Uh, could this be a way for CM Punk to dip his toes in AEW? I think that the main problem with that is that CM Punk returning in that role would overshadow everything else completely because CM Punk is the biggest name free agent comfortably. Um, you know, in, in wrestling, no one else return could compare to that. So if you put him alongside Darby Allen as Darby Allen's manager, there's the idea that this might give Darby some kind of rub, and it would to a certain degree, but the story would be about CM Punk. The story wouldn't be about Darby Allen by default, and that to me would be a major, major problem um, and would make the situation unworkable for me. Uh, right, final question today comes from Mark Lee Willis, which sort of links to today's and finally. We'll get into it in June, due course. Before that, though, Mark Lee Willis says, uh, Morning, I hope that Adam Wilborn has kept hidden from you-know-who from across the pond. I have indeed, Mark. As I said, I'll get to that in a second. Thank goodness for the whole travel ban situation. I think that's still in effect anyway. Um... Mark says, if you, Andy Murray, had to pick anyone else in the world to be your co-host, who you got? And Adam's job title is hashtag a bloody good quizzer. Uh. But what are <laughs> everyone else's at what culture? So who would you have as a co-host, Andy? Uh, Gangrel, obviously. Oh. Me and Gangrel doing the news would be absolutely outstanding. Or uh, Josh Brown from gaming, because why not? Um, God, I miss his little face. Uh, is, have you seen his hair in lockdown? It's majestic. He's got a beard and everything. It's... Chef's kiss. Also, um, shout out to you and Patterson for that mustache over the lockdown. It's something else, isn't oh. it? It's super you and Mario. Um, <laughs> <laughs> job titles. I mean, I'm bald guy number three, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, man, what else have we got? Ben Roy Turner, our lovely editor, is the green grocer for reasons that exist. Not drug uh, related. I should no, point no. out, not drug related. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Zoe from uh, Gaming and Comics is uh, I don't, a millennial or something. I don't know. <laughs> we call her that even though she's the only person in the office who isn't a millennial. Um, it just It's annoying. Who else have we got, brother? I'm running out of people. Uh, just stylish man in the office, Adam Nicholas. Uh, grumpiest man in the office, Michael Sidgwick. Oldest man in the office, Michael Hamplett, of course. Can't and believe he's 10 years older than everyone else, man. What a riot. Um, a boatiest man in the office, Phil Chambers. Top pirate. Uh, baldest man in the office, Jules runs you pretty close. Yeah, yeah, he's got. Mm, yep, he, well, he's won the award two years in a row. Yeah, so unlucky baldy. Snazziest man in the office has to go to Adam Cleary for that <laughs> that jacket he wears on the quizzes. Um, and nastiest man in the office, Simon Miller. Horrible when the cameras aren't rolling. <laughs> You'd never know. You'd never know. He pinches people when they're on camera with him. Just, just out of sight. Just pinches them every five seconds. Yeah. Watch out next time. That's yeah. why we don't want to work with him. That's why we're never on camera with him. I'm joking, of course. He is the loveliest man in the whole of wrestling. Which sort of leads me on to today's and finally. Um, God, this is horrible. So, thanks everyone. Like, we do appreciate your support on the news, but you're all a bunch of bloody grasses, aren't you? Because I called out Lance Archer, who'd already called out Simon Miller on Twitter, and then you all told him about it, and then over the weekend, Lance Archer found out about this, and yeah, he's coming after Miller, and now me! I mentioned Andy! Why isn't Andy getting attacked in all this? Um, I did enjoy the fact that Miller now has... Whatever the opposite of a kill list, um, he's got like four or five people who are after him. That includes the likes of Haku, Tamatonga, I don't know if that's been resolved yet, Sammy Callahan, now Lance Archer. And now I've got, well, Lance Archer as well, apparently. And still Chris Cyborg. Chris Cyborg tweeted me again. <laughs> I jokingly tweeted me like, oh, I'll help you with that, Lance, Har with Lance, Lance Archer um, if you help me out with Chris Cyborg. And she just tweeted, your time will come. So thanks, everyone. You better get Gangrel on the blower, Andy, because I'm not long for this world. Yeah, this is, this is, this is not good. Uh, you've got one of the scariest pro wrestlers in the world and the scariest women's mixed martial artist of all time. Uh, coming for you. It's, you know, I've got the pine box ready, brother. It's, it's in production. It was nice knowing you. We've had a good run. You know, we've been doing this news video for about two years now, but all good things come to an end. And I'll pour one out when you're gone. Indeed. If we leave you with one thought today, it is snitches get stitches, all right? Stop being a grass. 
Only, yeah. It's only joking, yeah. lads. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I'm so, I'm reminded of that bit in the in between. Is oh, sorry. Uh, right. <laughs> Let us know your thoughts on that and all today's news stories in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And subscribe to What Cool Wrestling on either iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts. As I said, the Raw preview a little bit later on today. Plus, you can get us on Twitter at What Culture WWE. Send us all your thoughts and questions on there. Uh, you can follow Andy Murray at. At Andy H. Murray, the H, I guess, stands for Happy Birthday, Triple H. <laughs> you can get me at Adam Wilborn. Get us all at What Culture WWE. But for now, my thanks to Andy Murray. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you soon.